Very good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, SCS IoT Chapter webinar series this evening with us. Um, we've got some interesting uh, speaking uh, topics uh, this evening uh, for, for us to take you through, uh, you know, IoT and manufacturing space. Uh, we've got two speakers uh, from the industry. First of all, uh, you know, we have got Casey. Casey, who comes from 15 years of experience in uh, software development and currently working with ARTC. Uh, where he designs IoT systems for the factory of the future uh, to accelerate the model factory implementation at the RTC. He's going to take us through some of the tracking technologies and methods uh, they're using in the modern manufacturing sector. And uh, after that, we've got Joseph, uh, who is CTO of Orc Industries and the IoT company that offers end to end uh, industrial operations analytics solution. He's going to take us through some of the use cases uh, in manufacturing and also challenges. Uh, faced by manufacturers and digitization and IoT adoption. So hopefully uh, it's gonna be an interesting evening for you all. Uh, before I uh, hand over to the first speaker, let me just uh, quickly uh, you know, go through what is what do we do in this chapter and why we are going through this webinar series. Um, so uh, my name is Sachin and I lead the, I'm the president of uh, SCS IoT chapter and uh, the vision for this uh, chapter is to pro pl provide a platform where professionals can learn and share knowledge, where we can promote a common understanding of IoT technologies, application and standards, and finally drive adoption of IoT products and services. Uh, so hopefully with this uh, webinar series, we aim to achieve uh, our vision and uh, provide a platform where we can you know, learn and share knowledge all across the industry. With that, uh, shall I hand over to Casey? Uh, I don't want to steal your thunder and time here. Casey, all over to you. Okay, thank you, Sachin. Uh, please allow me to share my screen. So everyone can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, so, uh, Hello everyone, nice to meet you all here. This is presentation by ERTC ASTAR, okay? Uh, first and foremost, thanks to the Singapore Computer Society for the inviting us uh, for sharing this uh, IoT use cases for manufacturing sector. Today, I will talk about the practical industry IoT for smart manufacturing, okay? This is a sharing session and mostly uh, we will cover on the basic knowledge of uh, IoT. Okay, so the agenda today, introduction to ERTC ASTAR, then followed by IoT Spectrum for manufacturing, then the uh, various connectivity solutions and services out there in the market. Then uh, later by this, uh, I will talk about the practical, how we uh, deploy IoT solution in the modern factory. Then the last topic, I will talk about the benefit of standardizing the communication layer in the modern factory, okay? My name is Casey Tenkeldi of IoT from ERDC ASTAR. So quickly overview of ERDC. Uh, we are under ASTAR and consortium for the, this uh, smart manufacturing industry. So here you can see is uh, members of our consortium. Okay, so we are trying to solve the industry 4.0 common problems by uh, our open consortium platform. And we try to support MNC SME companies to grow Singapore economy. We are working for the that's a public private partnership program and to collaborate and develop our future manufacturing technologies based on the real world problems. We are in open platform for both uh, end user and technical provider work hand in hand with the ERDC team to develop solution based on industry 4.0 principle. So we are also setting up the test pad at the ERTC, just outside the NPU, okay, for the individual technology showcasing. Okay, nice. Okay, uh, we work in pretty much uh, every uh, industry in vertical and leverage all the different kind of IoT applications such as computer vision, AI, connectivity, hyper-personalization, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and uh, you can see in this slide some of the work that uh, we have done so far. Mm -hmm. So these are the, some of the practical technologies demonstrated in ERTC. Firstly, uh, connectivity uh, to collect the data. 
So later, visualize, analyze this data in MICR. We call it MICR, uh, Manufacturing Intelligent Control Room. Then AR, VR, AGV, robot, full robot on top of the AGV and become the mobile manipulation robot. Then we also already implement the 5G infrastructure in ARTC. So we can upload camera data from the robots and can do processing on the server rather than on the edge. Then uh, we do digital twin and simulation also. Okay, these are the few uh, projects and what we are going to do, what, what we have done in the ERTC, okay? So now I briefly go through the whole spectrum of the how IoT apply in manufacturing industry. And later we focus a little bit more on the tracking devices and connectivity in manufacturing area. Okay. Uh, there are so many architecture in IIoT. So this is the simplest architecture. We call ISA 95. So what, uh, which one I'm going to use here to explain. So level zero is the uh, sensor curator and smart sensor layer. Level one is a PLC and IoT gateway layer. Level two is a SCADA layer. Level three is the MES historian, that's the database layer. Then level four is a ERP, that level is a business layer. Level five is a cloud layer, okay? Uh, we also adapt some other architecture like Rami 4.0 and uh, edge space architecture in our manufacturing sector. So edge space architecture is a, another hot trend and then loss of benefit also. So for the future trend that we can foresee uh, in the near future is uh, combining the, this uh, edge space architecture together with the uh, container-based technology. So that will be the, the near future. They will come up this trend. Okay, uh, let's talk about, this is the uh, general approach for any digital transformation. Any digital transformation need to go through these three stages, monitoring stage, uh, optimization, then the autonomy. Autonomy is the target that uh, all industry people try to achieve. So connectivity, including the shop floor connectivity and enterprise connectivity is the most fundamental stage and foundation for any digitization journey. So uh, we need to build that this uh, monitoring layer first, then the later need to implement that this intelligent layer on top of that, okay? Okay, now everybody know Google Translate, right? So very popular tools to convert one language to another. Our actual job in ARTC is uh, like the Google Translator. We convert machine signal to the uh, human language, okay? So PAM only tell us the his signal. And then we need to translate it into the human language like, oh, I need your help. One of my motor will damage in three months. Okay, so you can see this is the left-hand side is the data. So right-hand side is the insightful information. So we are trying to convert this uh, data into the insightful information. So this conversion is actually a big topic. So today, uh, because of the, the time limit, so I only cover on the left-hand side how to get the data, okay? So any digital transformation, data is most important. Okay, very first step is uh, to get the data, okay? In order to get data, you need DAQ. So what is DAQ? DAQ is, uh, I think everybody know, uh, data acquisition device. Any industry, any business, to increase the efficiency, you need to know the current status of your line, current status of your process, status of your factory, status of your business, right? So I mean, uh, you need to visualize the status of the whole entire business. Then only after that you know the status, right? Then you need to uh, tune it uh, in order to improve it. So uh, data is important. Okay, uh, this is the general connectivity flow. As I mentioned earlier, most important is uh, how to transform data into uh, insightful information, okay? So DAQ is uh, collecting data from the sensors, then send this data to the gateway, then these uh, gateways send this data to the platform, can be either on-premise or cloud, to convert the data into the insightful information, okay? So when you send data from the sensors to the platform, there are so many data transmission standard and protocol involved. Data transmission standard means uh, PLE, ZB, uh, ultra wideband, LoRa, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, etc. Protocol can be the MOPAS, OPC UA, MQTT, etc. So uh, protocol need to sit on top of the uh, data transmission method. Example, okay, uh, MOPAS RTU sit on top of the RS485. Then the OPC UA 
sit on top of the uh, internet TCP IP, etc., etc. Okay. Okay. Since uh, this is the technical talk in the Singapore Computer Society, so I will refer to the OSI model that everyone already familiar with. So you can see the OSI seven layer, right? So physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. Left hand side, you can see. Uh, so the top three uh, layer, application, presentation, and session layer using the data. Then the transport layer use the segment of the data. Now what layer use the packet of the data. Then the data link layer uh, use the frame of the data. Then the physical layer is using the bit and byte of the data. Okay. So here we are mapping the communication protocols with the OSI layer, okay? Protocol need to sit, just now I mentioned, protocol need to sit on top of the data transmission standard, right? Okay, so this is a protocol, okay? So protocol, most of the protocol uh, with the IP plane in the, this uh, transport layer, and then the data transmission standard is a lowest two layer, data link and physical layer, which are handling the data frame and base. So you can see that MQTT, HTTP, OPC UA, MOPAS TCP sit on top of the TCP layer, okay? Then the, we choose the IP uh, for the data transmission. But you can see the right hand more side. Okay, MOBAS RTU, you don't need to use the IP. And then the application layer directly communicates straight to the data link layer and physical layer. Okay. Okay, I'll go for the next slide. Okay, this is uh, some design consideration for protocol and then the transmission standard. Okay. So here is uh, some design consideration for the selection. Please choose according to your use cases. What protocol to use for your IoT project? You need to choose based on your requirement of your project. When you need low bandwidth and the intermittent condition, okay, you may choose uh, MQTT. So when you need to implement a SCADA and that you have uh, okay, a uh, very fast Ethernet, then yes, you can choose the OPC UA. Then you need to send the data across the internet then you may choose the HTTP, okay? Same thing apply for the throughput and range also. If your application need a high throughput, then you may need Wi-Fi or 4G. Uh, if you need a long range and low throughput, then you may choose the LP1, etc., etc. cetera. So uh, what to choose in your IoT project? The one is based on your project requirement, so choose wisely. Okay, now let's talk about the various connectivity solutions and services in the market out there and their application. Just now we already talked about uh, how important is the data, multiple protocols, then various data transmission standard. Now, how to collect the data from the shop floor? So here is a few options, okay? Read uh, PLC memory data directly. Okay, second option, additional sensor installation like uh, use current clamp or new sensor installation. Uh, current clamp is, uh, means uh, something like this, okay? So it means a three phase, right? So you need to clamp your sensor. So you need to clamp your power cable with this, okay, clamp it. Then this one is a wireless transmission node. Send it back to your uh, gateway, okay? So then read from IO, okay, same thing, okay? Then the last matter is uh, using the OCR technology. Uh, later, I will explain more detail on that. Okay, uh, firstly, I will I'll tell you the, how to read the PLC memory data. In this option, uh, you should have the PLC program access or need to talk to your SI system integrator, okay? So why? Because you need to know which data memory of PLC is storing the sensor information. There are, now there are the few software out there in the market to collect the PLC data directly. So first two uh, is uh, this uh, software solutions. Then they support most of the, almost uh, all the PLC brand. Last one is the hardware solution and then support major PLC brand. Pricing is uh, just for your reference only, okay? Okay, second option. Second option, if you don't have access to the PLC program, so what are you going to do? So you need to put the additional sensor like just now, I show you the additional car, uh, current clamp or some other sensor, okay? There are lots of wire wireless sensor solution in the market that need to choose based on your requirement, your budget and ROI. All these solutions I show here have their own IoT system, okay? These are two, three solutions, Monik, then Org, then Avantec, so uh, all wireless uh, sensor solution. They have their own IoT system. So 
what is the IoT system? Okay, IoT system is the one that create value for you by combining the people, things, and system. So all these solutions have their own IoT system, and from there, the solution middle one, the uh, solution from the auth that we are using is uh, quite promising, uh, easy to use, easy to set up, and flexible. Uh, they provide more than the data collection solution, and then their OEE cloud solution is uh, quite impressive also. So I won't talk all, uh, here a lot, as the later Joseph will cover it. Okay, so if all these above mentioned methods uh, can use due to the same reason, is about that condition that uh, you cannot install the new sensor, okay? And then the IO also, you cannot put it. Then at the same time, you don't have a PLC access. So what are you going to do? So at the time, you can use the OCR technology. So OCR technology is uh, this uh, image recognition technology to convert the image data, screen data to the digital value and you can send it to your backend. So it means that some of the old machine, they don't have any communication protocol. So, but uh, they do come with uh, this uh, the screen, display screen. So this data, the screen data, we capture it, transform it into the digital value and send it back to your backend. The first one, the AD link is the hardware solution. And then the, another two are the RPA software solution. The now RPA, RPA means a robotic process automation. That is a trend. And then the, you can use lots of automation other than OCR, okay? Uh, these RPA tools, uh, you can use it uh, to automate your process also. Okay, now time to talk about the, this uh, practical use cases, okay? So here's a some practical DAQ application in ARTC. We deploy some of these uh, data collection sensors mentioned earlier, okay? So this is a assembly line in one of our uh, assembly area. So we are using the uh, Monet wireless sensor Bosch temperature humidity sensor, RFID sensor, et cetera, et cetera. So right hand side, you can see the data transmission architecture. So all these sensors are connected to the uh, back of PLC, okay? Back of PLC is uh, the, not the head PLC, that is a soft PLC, okay? So all these data is inside the sensor data is inside the PLC data memory. We are using the capware, the software that I mentioned earlier to read the data from that back of PLC. Then send this sensor data to the ThingWorks. ThingWorks is the, one of the IoT platform that can transform your data into the insightful information, okay? Okay, I will go for the second use cases. Okay, from this use case, I, 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 will, tell you, I will tell you the problem statement first, right? Usually, production environments are mostly metallic. People are moving around. Tools are moving as well, and then lots of uh, wireless noise also. So this lead to the uh, time wasting for searching tool if you're not tracking properly then, and then that may lead to the bottleneck of your life. Okay, this is a problem statement. Okay, okay, this is the technology to solve that problem. Okay, indoor positioning and tracking system using BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. Okay, middle one, you can see that is an antenna, you need to install it on the ceiling. So then the tech is uh, the sensor that you need to put on the people or a set that you want to track. Uh, we also implement the in-house solution using the ultra wideband, so but giving the similar result, okay? Okay, uh, this is the uh, how that technology apply in ERTC. So antenna installed on the ceiling, as I mentioned earlier, on the shop floor. Then middle one, you can see the front end UI for access tracking. So this gentleman is uh, using this uh, UI and looking for his amazing tool. Okay, with this technology, right, you can use to track your product flow also. So you put this tracking tag to your, this uh, partially assembled unit, and then the, you can track that, how long will it take in the individual station, and then you can check where is the bottleneck of your process flow. So you, you can uh, use this technology in many ways. Okay, here I'm showing you the benefit of that technology. So three main category, manpower, assets, and then process can be optimized. Okay, for manpower optimization, so you can uh, get the better manpower utilization, worker access control, visitor tracking. So for assets optimization is the uh, automated and then this uh, optimized inventory, then the less time searching for the tools and pads. For process optimization is the, uh, you can optimize your process layout. 
then the you you can know that after you track the, your process right you know that where is the bottleneck then that can lead to the uh, lower production cost okay so i told you the problem i told you the technology solutions and the benefit of using that okay okay here there's another use case that use case is that uh, we use that uh, also using the BLE uh, indoor tracking system. So you can see the guy, the, the first one, first picture. So that guy is uh, the operator. You need to lock into the MES. MES is the manufacturing execution system before they start executing their job for the day, okay? So below you can see our assembly line. Our assembly line have the pressure sensing map and then all our monitor and the IoT connectivity system. So once operator step on the pressure map, IoT system got notified and then send request to the BLE tracking system via REST API to know who is stepping on it. So operator is uh, wearing the BLE tag and then system know who is it and then respond back to the IoT system accordingly. Once IoT system know the person who step on the pressure map, right, is authorized, then the IoT system trigger to the MES system to automatically lock in uh, for him. So he no need to lock into the MES manually. Okay, so this is the one of the simple use case among others, uh, which we already implement in ARTC Smart Factory test well. Okay, uh, the benefit of standardizing the communication layer in the modern factory. So this will be the, my last topic, okay. Okay, uh, last time before open communication was well developed, each and every Huawei vendor uh, developed their own proprietary connection to kids and Huawei. So that's NS uh, uh, system complexity in the factory. You can see in the below picture, okay? Vendor Ace HMI only can communicate with the vendor Ace uh, PLC. Vendor Y historian only can communicate to the vendor Y PLC, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that is a headache. Okay, uh, once after open standard began more popular and acceptable, all our engineer life began the much more easy as the vendor A SCADA can talk to the vendor Y uh, PLC as well as the vendor Z HMI. Okay, everyone speak the same language in the shop lot. So uh, with that, uh, we all can work together in the one platform to achieve the higher efficiency. Uh, so this is uh, one of the advantages of standardizing protocol in the manufacturing. Okay, uh, we are using the, this uh, uh, commercial software, okay, in order to set up the standardized OPC UA server in the manufacturing, there is a capware. But there's a, I, I'm not uh, telling that you need to use capware. You can use any equivalent software, okay? So uh, this software, capware have the three layer. The first one is a driver lever, can communicate to the, uh, almost all the PLC brand. So middle one is a server, set up the, whatever all the sensor information, transform it to the OPC UA server. Then the interface is the one that connect to the this all those database and then the business layer through the MQTT or the REST protocol. Okay, by implementing this uh, centralized data flow through centralized and secure architecture, company can provide single source of uh, industrial data to uh, all of the this automation devices, machine and software application. Then your whole system design became uh, more flexible and then more robust. Okay. Okay, so here is a ISA 95 architecture again. Okay, in level one of the ISA 95 PLC layer, there are lots of brand, a lots of device, lots of sensor, and then uh, we standardize all these protocol in, uh, into the, this uh, common standard uh, layer like the OBC UA server. So all those assets in the operation became uh, OBC UA server. Let's say uh, you, you have an assembly machine, that assembly machine, all the data is posed as the OBC UA server. Okay, CNC machine, also transform into the OBC UA server. Everything is the OBC UA server. For, so for your case, it's a, for uh, means the business level, at least all the application, they no need to deal with a different kind of the protocol. They only need to deal with the only OBC UA. So that's again more standardized, okay? So with that approach, you no need to consider each and individual low level device and protocol when working on the high level business or operational system. So for us, it's a, for top floor, uh, top floor and short floor. Top floor, we use uh, REST and MQTT. Okay, for short floor, it's uh, mostly the all OPC UA. Yeah. Okay, uh, another benefit. Another benefit is uh, scaling. 
you can expand your system easily in the future also, okay, if you follow that standardization. Okay, example, you set up the connectivity at the FAT side, means a FAT FAT tree. So they are using the protocol A and B. So you, you put the local translator there. So in, the, in this case, it's a capway, and then translate whatever protocol into protocol Z, okay? Then you can create your business layer, business application, like analytic, the delay, or whatever, historian, all those things on top of that layer. So uh, when you acquire the, another factory or build new plan uh, in 10 years later down the road, then that plan use the protocol C and D. Okay, so same thing, you put the gateway there, okay, cap server, then the, the, you standardize all those uh, protocol into same protocol, protocol D. So anything you build on the HMI or analytics or whatever business layer, okay, you show in the business layer on the factory one, still the same. So when you add the new site, new factory online, everything will look the same also. So that allow you to deploy quickly. Everything is in place. And then you just changing the adapter only. Okay, so then digitization became uh, much, much more transparent, increased compatibility, more standardized and easier to work with, okay? Okay. This is the uh, common problem in the digital transformation, okay? So uh, you can see that lack of data interoperability, lack of sensorization, lack of machine connectivity, lack of digital scale, lack of investment. So these are the common problems, okay? So I, uh, during this uh, short timing, at least uh, I already covered some of these uh, problems briefly, okay? So this will be my last slide, summary and approach. So before you do any digital project, please do these three steps. First one is uh, begin with a business objective in mind. Second, start with the basic calculation that implement in phase by phase uh, to improve the ROI. Most of the topic that I presented is uh, based on the technical perspective only. So but uh, most important thing is uh, start with the business value in mind. So even in technical, I only focus on the visit of how to capture the data. The rest are just touch and go only, okay? Uh, there are a lot more in IIoT area. Uh, due to the time limit, uh, I won't cover all IoT spectrum, okay? Even in connectivity area. So continue explore by yourself if you interest in this area, okay? Okay, thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed this talk. You guys can keep in touch with me uh, if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Casey. So, thank you. Uh, that was very insightful presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to bring our next speaker here. Uh, Joseph, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can over, you hear me? Over to you. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, let me just try to share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, uh, Sachin. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Joseph from All Industries. Um, so the title of today's webinar is uh, Overcoming the Hype uh, in Industrial 4.0 for Manufacturing. And it's, it's funny that we should have to add for manufacturing as a qualifier because I'm sure as everybody probably knows, uh, Industry 4.0 has its roots in manufacturing. Um, in Germany, where the term was first coined, the intelligent networking of machines uh, and processors they are recognized to be game changers. Cyber, uh, cyber physical systems, uh, internet of things, technologies can enable powerful use of data to unlock new possibilities, or as they call it, the fourth uh, industrial revolution. But precisely because of the excitement it generated, it's now everywhere, right? It's ubiquitous. Like uh, banking 4.0, you hear about workforce 4.0, education 4.0, even uh, the Singapore government wants uh, public service 4.0. Right, so indeed, there are many promising and revolutionary use cases for new technologies. But beyond the hype, uh, we may wonder, is there significant ROI uh, for investment into these technologies? Even in manufacturing, um, there are a lot of applications. Casey has covered some of them earlier in his sharing. Um, things like asset tracking, uh, workforce tracking, inventory management, process parameter optimization, and the list goes on. Uh, but today, I, will, I, I would like to share more on the digitization of manufacturing operations. We'll focus more on covering uh, some of the common challenges faced by manufacturers uh, when embarking on their digital transformation journey. 
uh, some practical tips on how to overcome them. And lastly, we will cover some uh, real world case studies uh, on the quantitative benefits that we can uh, hope to derive from adopting IoT solutions on the manufacturing shop floor. Uh, if you have any questions, please note them down in the chat. I uh, will be happy to answer them uh, at the end if we have time. Um, okay, right. So, so these are some of the top digitization goals uh, which are most relevant to uh, many industrial operations. Uh, I won't go into details, but just to preface the presentation on the scope of some of these use cases in manufacturing. Right, I think uh, top of the list is to increase operational effectiveness. Uh, reduce asset downtime or improve uh, reliability. So this is from the maintenance angle. Uh, energy cost savings, product quality improvements, and of course, safety uh, and security for, for, the, for the operators. Right, in a recent survey conducted by think tanks, uh, many executives of uh, big companies state that I4.0 and digital transformation is a top strategic priority. Yet we find that only few are making significant progress uh, on their digital transformation journey. Um, there are many reasons cited. I think Casey just now has uh, gone through some of them as well. Uh, but I think chief of which uh, manufacturers, are manufacturers are typically working with uh, brownfield factories 99% of the time, right? So they have many older uh, analog machines uh, and even newer machines uh, of different brands and models. So very often, as far as operations are concerned, uh, it's not very useful to have just a handful of machines connected with data while there are no data from the rest of the machines. Right, the cost of integration uh, with PLCs, uh, provided that the interface is even available, uh, development work for data dashboards, uh, managing the data, IT infrastructure and servers, and even machine connectivity, these are very real barriers and obstacles to I4.0 adoption. To be sure, they are not impossible problems, uh, but just to give some perspective cost-wise, we have heard from customers uh, who are intending to cover their entire factory with Wi-Fi connectivity, they were looking at costs upwards of 200K even before any uh, physical hardware device or, or engineering work uh, starts, right? So if I can summarize this slide, the, the three uh, key barriers of entries are cost effectiveness, uh, the complexity of uh, industrial systems, and the specialized skills required to manage and maintain the systems. So what we, what we set out to do, what we are doing here at Org Industries uh, is to hopefully tear down these walls one by one. We make it five to 10 times more cost effective. Uh, we improve project cycle time by deploying in days in uh, instead of months. We take away the prerequisite for a complicated and deep set of skills required. And the goal really is to serve the global market in the industrial world and make I4.0 and IoT available to every industrial company, whether big or small, global or local. So far we've deployed across uh, multiple industry sectors, including FMCG, uh, food manufacturing, um, electronics, semiconductors, uh, metal processing, injection molding, medical device manufacturing, and, and many, many more. Right, some notable projects uh, and customers we have uh, include McKinsey, uh, SD Engineering, SETS, BRF, uh, Astra Group, Paragon, NCS, et cetera. Right, so coming back to the obstacles to technology adoption uh, in manufacturers. Um, sorry. Sorry, I'm missing a slide here, uh, but I'll just, I'll just go through it. Uh, coming back to the obstacles for technology adoption in uh, manufacturers, I think some of the lessons that we can glean from successful adoptions of IoT, uh, I4.0 are suggested uh, in three Cs that I would like to uh, just uh, 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 provide you. Clarity, number one, is to adopt, like what Casey has mentioned, uh, to adopt a clear set of ob uh, business objectives, right? Instead of a never ending chase after the latest uh, technologies, Recognize that uh, technology is only a, a means to an end and, and that end ultimately has to be a business outcome. Technology, technology is great only if it's applied in the correct uh, context. And so not all technologies are relevant for all use cases. Uh, in, in, in any business, it's almost always the case that only a small number of levers will account for disproportionately huge 80% of effects or outcomes. And so the hallmark of a clear set of business objectives is that it should contain concisely of those few key points. Right? If you find yourself uh, with a long laundry list of wish lists and features, uh, then we can almost be sure that the cost will be very high, project cycles will be very long, and the effectiveness will be uh, diluted. But the second C is a cyclical approach or an agile approach. Uh, that's uh, instead of trying to survey the entire landscape of technologies uh, 
and vendors and going through going into every minutest detail or trying to plan a multi-year project involving all departments or levels before even taking the first step. Uh, companies should pilot small projects uh, and iterate quickly based on the feedback gathered on a small pilot group of users. This approach of decision making is much more informed and nimble, but more importantly, uh, companies will be able to reap the benefits of technology early on. Right? Some companies take up to two to three years, even just shortlisting and selecting a vendor for pilot projects. But the truth is, if technology is su such a game changer to the business, it's going to be a huge waste in terms of the time and the lost opportunities to delay adoption by a few years. But the last C is uh, change management. Technology is a useful tool, but by itself it's not magic. Uh, data connectivity to machines by itself doesn't somehow magically improve operations if users do not make use of or they, are, they do not act on the, data, the insights gathered. But in this respect, digital transformation is a transformation not just of technology use, but of people and of process workflow as well. How do we equip people and transform their day-to-day -day workflow, uh, engage everyone from management to frontline operators on the use of data so that the decision-making can be based objectively uh, without bias on data? So I think I'm, I'm uh, having the wrong set of slides. So maybe let me just pull out the correct slide deck and uh, our complex management is a very important tool uh, and it's extended to machines, resources, processes, and even sometimes manpower so that manufacturers can identify problems and make adjustments to their production plan as is necessary. Many performance management systems are currently uh, still entirely analog, relying heavily on whiteboards uh, and spreadsheet printouts, which also means a lot of uh, manual work on even basic data collection and processing, not to mention they are uh, error prone, uh, have infrequent updates, and very often uh, data accessibility and availability uh, is, a, is a big issue. Right, so digital performance management uh, in this respect takes a quantum leap, right? allows a clear mechanism for uh, one single standard for KPI benchmarking. Uh, reports can automatically be generated without human inter intervention and alerts can be triggered for timely issue resolution. Right, performance dialogues across all levels on a single source of truth can take place, enabling close loop action trackers to drive uh, performance improvements. Sorry, let me go back to this. Yeah, so um, as, a, as a solution, Okay, sorry. As a solution, we help to address these issues uh, by building a modular system made up of both uh, hardware, as you can see on the left, uh, that can be installed universally across machines, uh, and, for, and, and as well as the software. Right? For the hardware, a simple analogy is that we make uh, Fitbit for machines. Uh, if you know what Fitbit does for humans, uh, it measures the steps, the heart rate, and the sleeping pattern, and we do the same, but for machines, right? For step count, we are really referring to the cycle count of the, the machines, and that's very, very useful for productivity analysis, tracking of input, output, uh, and yield. For heart rate, we are actually referring to conditions uh, which give a good indication of health of the machine. Um, this include parameters like a current of a primary motor, uh, temperature of the lubricant, back pressure of a filter, and these information are very powerful for improving reliability of the equipment and sometimes even the quality of the product. And lastly, for sleeping pattern, this is information on whether the equipment is functioning effectively, uh, broken down, or simply idling, waiting for a job to start. Right, for software, we draw from the collective experience of the team um, with management consulting experience in McKinsey, uh, process specialists, um, data experts, hardware and software engineers uh, to codify the best analytics used in operations management by human experts into algorithms, which we can then use to identify bottleneck processes, break down performance losses into OE categories and subcategories, in order to provide uh, valuable insights for streaming, streamlining uh, manufacturing operations. We are in essentially automating, scaling, and disrupting many aspects of uh, ops consultants' uh, job. We, what we have also done is to break down a complex industrial IoT system into modular parts, just like Lego blocks. Right? Lego is very uh, versatile. It can be used to assemble a basic solution for a small company, much like how a, a child would play with blocks to build a small toy, uh, but yet a large MNC can also use the same blocks uh, to build a sophisticated system. And just like Lego, the platform allows users to build their own data models and even synthesizing data from different devices and user inputs for a variety of use cases, all without any 
coding involved. Hence, this LT system becomes mass customizable and self-deployable. In fact, we recently uh, shipped the pilot kit uh, via DHL to Europe, where we had a short 30 minutes uh, video call to familiarize clients with the tool. Uh, and after which, within two hours, they could successfully connect, connect their machines and were streaming data live to the dashboard. Right, so this, this uh, slide is a uh, simple architecture about how it works. I think uh, Casey has already gone through something like that, so I won't really go into too much detail. Um, but very briefly, on the left, we have the IoT uh, node devices. They are connected to existing sensors on the machines. The node devices has an edge processor which reads uh, sensors at very high frequencies uh, and processes these at low level but high speed data depending on the configured mode, aggregates them before pushing them to the gateway by a long range uh, RF mesh network. The gateway then orchestrates and manages the encrypted communication with IoT devices, load balances uh, the data transmission of up to a thousand machines uh, depending on the push rate. Uh, the, the Dell gateway then uh, streams the data to each asset onto the database on a secure cloud platform. And there's also buffering uh, incorporated onto the gateway so that it can be tolerant to uh, intermittent, intermittent network connectivity. The cloud platform then ingests the high volume, high velocity data and does transformations on data as is required, uh, as well as run analytic workloads to prepare the insights for visualization. Some of these insights uh, include machine uh, utilization metrics like OEE, which is uh, overall equipment effectiveness, cycle time, which is the time required to produce one part, bottlenecks, uh, defect rates, among others. Finally, the data is streamed to near real time to end clients on computers, uh, tablets, and mobile devices. Right, we have notifications and alerts that can be sent via email, SMS, or even database uh, messaging tools like WhatsApp or Telegram. And this enables users uh, finally to gain real-time insights and, and make better and more timely operational uh, decisions, thus improving effectiveness and efficiency of the organization. We've also built APIs that are that more sophisticated users uh, who may want to customize their own dashboards or connect to their existing ERP or MES systems can do so to enable seamless uh, data flow across their systems. Right, so this is a slide from BCG to help us uh, understand more about the history of IT and OT in the industrial world. IT refers to information technology and OT is more on the operational technology or industrial automation, which is relating more to uh, machines on the factory shop floor. Traditionally, the two are separated and the engineer that programs the machines probably never needs to interface with the IT manager who manages uh, the IT infrastructure. But over time, they merge closer and closer and in today's modern architecture, you will often find five uh, and of course in uh, KC slide is actually six uh, uh, layers with the cloud uh, layer sitting right at the top. So this five or six layer architecture illustrated here often seems to suggest that information flow is seamless from the bottom level IO to, to ERP or even to the cloud. But there's often a still, still a very huge fault line between uh, IT and OT or between level three and four here, which is uh, the uh, SCADA and the MES. In many cases, the higher level software is not actually connected to physical machines. And to track production progress, it's often uh, still fundamentally reliant on humans to, to key in uh, uh, barcodes to the system uh, where operators scan the barcode at every single station uh, after completion. Some of the more adventurous companies will even use RFID. But if you think about it, RFID as a technology is more uh, suited for finished goods in a warehouse because every product is then completed and standardized. There, you can use RFID to track each uh, box and location. And uh, com big companies like Amazon, they use it a lot in their warehouses. But what if you're trying to track a work in progress inventory, such as a bottle cap, right, which is still not attached to the bottle body? It then becomes very difficult. Or if you want to trace like a turbine blade or of an aircraft engine, and the metal part goes into a heat treatment furnace at 2,000 degrees, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to have RFID uh, uh, attached onto the, onto the blade. Right, for these reasons, uh, many companies still fall back to the trusty barcode system and human entry. So where does IoT fit in, in this grand scheme? So at all industries, uh, we typically connect uh, devices to the lowest layer at the, IoT, uh, at the IO level or the PLC without needing to invest uh, in cumbersome and expensive infrastructure. And we take data straight to the top at the application layer to give uh, users powerful insights and support better uh, business decisions. Right, uh, so just a word on this, uh, since I think Casey has covered this quite uh, in detail. So there are two main approaches for connecting uh, to machines. On the left, we can connect via uh, the lowest level, which is the IO. Uh, and alternatively, on the right, we can connect to level two uh, 
uh, on the controller level or, or PLCs. So for us, in all industries, we prefer uh, and we typically connect to most of the machines, maybe say 90% of the time at the IO level. And the reason is very simple. Just like in physics, when we go down to the lowest level, the smallest basic building blocks, the atoms and the structures all start to look uh, similar. It's the same for machines and their sensors. Connection to the IO level uh, is most universal and tends to be have, have the fastest uh, setup time. Conversely, it's possible to connect the controller via a serial interface or some higher level protocol. And we could do that as well. But this often involves quite a bit of development or integration work. Uh, and that is if there is even an existing interface for you to tap on. When we take a look, at, closer look at machines, we will find that regardless of shape or size, the sensors uh, in use are often very standard. Right on the left, you can see some examples such as the proximity sensor, uh, the contactors or the relays, temperature sensors, etc. And what we do is we connect these sensors to the IoT node, which has an edge processor built in, uh, and we can connect up to six sensors. And if that's still not enough, uh, feel free to stack another node. So a very neat thing uh, is when we connect to machines at the IO level, is often we don't even need to install additional sensors because they are already part of the machine. Right, so next we talk about the, the software. Connecting hardware to machines to collect data, of course, is just uh, an enabler and by itself is not very useful. The analysis, the performance tracking and insight that we can draw from the data is much, much more important. And this is the real goal that we aim to achieve. Here on this slide is an example of a real-time dashboard and it is designed for simplicity and clarity. We start with a basic canvas, a blank canvas, and the app allows users uh, from different organizations to construct their own dashboards using tiles and blocks for each asset. By scanning the unique QR code on each uh, IoT node, the identifier for each uh, uh, device is associated with the corresponding gateway for authentication and edge, process, uh, edge processor configuration. And as a drag and drop interface, the dashboard can be configured by the end users very quickly. We can then model the operations and represent the process flow on the factory shop floor. And the concept behind this uh, dashboard is built on industry best practices. In the manufacturing and service operations world, a very powerful tool called NIFA, which stands for Manufacturing Information Flow Analysis, championed by Toyota. The Toyota production system is well known around the world and is often the gold standard for lean manufacturing. In the Western world, it may be similarly recognized as the uh, value stream mapping, and refers to adding value to product from raw material on the left at every step until it finally becomes uh, finished goods uh, on the right. So in the past with conventional methods, uh, lean action workouts may involve a huge drawing block with post-its and the processes are surveyed like once a year to identify bottlenecks and improve operations. And what we are doing here is simply to leverage the power of technology and build it real time and live 24-7. So this becomes a single source of truth uh, containing all the ops information necessary for your whole organization. And of course, if we double click into uh, any of those assets or blocks, which represent one machine each, we can deep dive into the detailed view of a single asset. This is where you can really see the steps, the heart rate and the sleeping pattern for every single machine. The type of data di uh, displayed depends on how many sensors you connect uh, and which parameters are important to you. For example, if you care a lot about the health and the quality, then you can connect to uh, the temperature, the pressure or fuel level of a liquid filling line. This can apply to discrete manufacturing, um, batch processing or even continuous flow processing. In discrete manufacturing, you can count the number of uh, cycles or pieces. If you do batch processing, you can identify the batch cycle time using our cycle recognition algorithm to automatically identify a single batch. If you have co continuous flow, you can measure parameters continuously and use anomaly detection to trigger real-time uh, alerts. Right, so uh, I think it's most useful to examine actual uh, real, real world case studies. So this is one of the three examples that we'll be sharing today. Uh, and this also happens to be one of our earliest clients. Um, the Singapore-based uh, company operates a bottle, bottling plant in Malaysia and we were invited to a day visit for a site walk and discussion. In the morning, the, the plant manager brought us on an introduction tour of the facilities and explained the different processes involved uh, from plastic pellets to blow molding, filling, labeling, packing, etc. By the end of the one hour tour, the, the GM was keen to actually do a small trial, which of course we were happy to support with the pilot kits that we brought. However, we needed to shut down the machines uh, because of electrical safety. And he explained that you will mean 
we only have the lunch time of 30 minutes to deploy. Right, so it, it was a really uh, intense experience connecting machines, uh, which we had just seen for the first time. But the, by, but the, by, but by the time the, the bell rang to mark the end of lunch, we had two production lines with five to six uh, critical equipment, uh, each streaming data live. This is the speed and the scale at which we can deploy uh, the OP industrial IoT system. And the subsequent impact on their operations is tremendous. If you look at the top graph, each bar is the daily output of a single machine. Right, this is how many companies, this is how usually you know, companies uh, are looking at their uh, daily production. They count and then they scan the number of pallets and multiply by the cartons or bottles to compute the total at the end of the day. Now what we did differently with IoT is to create the bottom chart. It looks like a barcode, but it really is tiny little bars representing output for each single minute. If the top daily total is like a black and white TV, then we are providing an ultra HD color screen uh, that displays the actual, actual uh, production situation pixel by pixel. Right? Every white line you see is a minute of zero output produced. Right? So in the past, performance is often based on historical trends or market rates. Maybe 40K is a good day, uh, 30K is a bad day. And in the finance world, it's very similar to how budgets are set, right? Using last, last year's budget to adjust maybe uh, plus minus 5% to set this year's goal. But in, in the ops practice, there's something called zero-based design, uh, similar to zero-based budgeting that is much more powerful. It looks at goals and targets from a clean slate, and that's exactly what we aim to do with our algorithm. The backend uh, analytics engine picks up the maximum capability of the equipment over time and applies this zero-based design to see whether, where it stands against uh, theoretical capability. So over time, the software actually learns the true potential of the, the equipment. And as you can probably see, the bottom chart was an eye-opener at the team, uh, for the team at the bottom plant. It, they immediately tried to improve their performance uh, and try to tackle the speed losses, as you can see. But on the second day, the bars were uh, raised higher, but not for long, because often machines may not have been uh, maintained very well, and they are operating at suboptimal conditions. So on Sunday, the, the, the blank here, uh, an overhaul was conducted to find root cause, and by Monday, operating speed was brought up to the nearly the design uh, speed. But by afternoon, there's a big white gap again and they, are, they, 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 they broke down. But over the course of the next few days, they kept working the equipment and training the operators until they were achieving high speed and high reliability. So if you compare the total, uh, it has already risen from 38K at the start to about 81K, which is, which is actually more than double. So this is very significant achievement because for this company, um, they are experiencing high demand growth. This means that they can save millions of dollars in capex that was originally planned to build a new plant. So for this case study, by resolving hidden problems with bottlenecks, they were able to quickly uh, capture top line revenue growth without even needing to invest uh, large capital into, into the, the plant. Right, so this, this, uh, this next example, this is a joint venture between uh, SATS, uh, which operates several logistics and food processing plants. Uh, and BRF, which is a world leader in uh, food production headquartered in uh, Brazil. In this second example, market demand is more mature and stable. So the company's focus uh, is more on uh, cost reduction and building a leaner organization. Right, so I think I'll speed up. Um, before this uh, uh, company, uh, the, the different departments are often debated when was the, the machine broken down and whether the, re the repair time was timely. Um, but now they have a single source of truth where everybody can uh, look at the dashboard and based on every minute or every second on when these uh, events occurred. Uh, and what they did with, with that is uh, in the past, the production team has always requested for additional equipment because they believe um, that the equipment was uh, uh, over, uh, the capacity of the equipment was not, not sufficient. But with this monitoring, it shows uh, that the equipment was sufficient overall and users were often fighting over, uh, over the use of the equipment at the same time during peak periods. At other non-peak periods, the equipment can be completely underutilized, right, which is uh, depicted in red. So they quickly got their planners back at the drawing board to examine how they can level load their equipment. So they applied the Hedronka principle in uh, Toyota manufacturing, or, or better trending now is a concept of flattening the curve. They staggered the production process for workflow at bottleneck processes to be spread evenly throughout the day. Right, so, so the impact of the performance and productivity of this plant was huge. Because together with other improvements, they managed to reduce work hours from 2.5 um, to 1.5 shifts. 
In fact, we now hear that the ship is aiming, uh, the team is aiming, is aiming uh, to, to reach a stretch goal of one single ship. So the impact of industrial IoT uh, in manpower savings and leaner organization is very significant. In fact, this is exactly what our Singapore government has been pushing companies to do, to work smarter instead of harder using excessive labor. Right, um, this third uh, case study, I'll probably just uh, skim through, but basically what they uh, focus more on uh, is quality defects, right? So uh, for them, they were able to capture defects um, by looking at the presence of cav cavities uh, in, in injection molding, and they managed to eliminate air bubbles in the plastic form uh, by monitoring the peak pressure and the cushion level. So for them uh, to be able to identify quality defects and identify deviations in process parameters early on, uh, before a much larger batch is produced uh, and, and they have to throw everything away, uh, is, is a huge improvement in reliability and as well as quality. So these are also common goals that our customer focuses on. Right? So some other illustrative uh, examples of the machines that we have uh, connected so far, just a flavor of the different shape, sizes, and variety. Um, really from simple machines such as industrial weighing scales shown on the bottom right, um, to bigger, uh, more sophisticated machines, uh, sometimes reaching the size of a train carriage um, for probably things like sheet metal processing. Um, other examples are gas monitoring, uh, gas pressure monitoring in the distribution network, utilities monitoring, um, high-speed plastic production, etc. Um, there's more here. So the canning lines, mill milling machines, coal rooms, drying machines. Uh, and the only way for us to achieve uh, this adaptability and flexibility is by breaking the industrial IoT system down into Lego-sized building blocks. So you can connect all uh, to all sorts of uh, sensors and actuators. One of our favorites is a small espresso machine that we, we always uh, bring along to exhibitions and trade shows. And we even brought it to Hanover Messer in Germany uh, two years back. So these are the other uh, visualizations uh, and tools. Um, Pareto OE waterfall chart that enables uh, users to sort and rank losses uh, based on the 80 to 80 20 Pareto principle, issue trackers, uh, trend comparators, multivariate regression analysis um, to establish things like energy load curves to improve plant efficiency. And we can implement condition-based uh, predictive maintenance to uh, avoid costly failures. Right, so these are all very have helpful to help uh, companies measure where they are and how to improve. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have a long pipeline of new exciting features that we are continuously uh, building and, and rolling out. Right, so this is uh, my last slide. Um, this is to really highlight the important, importance of uh, scalability. So we are able to serve a very small company uh, with a pilot kit on the left, uh, all the way to large enterprises with thousands of machines. Uh, this benefits small, medium, or even large enterprises alike. Without heavy infrastructure investment needed and teams or specialized uh, expertise as, as prerequisite, uh, the cost scales linearly without requirements for minimal size to achieve a, an economy of scale. So landing back on what we set out to do as a company, uh, we hope that with the modularity and the scalability that we've built into the system, um, we are able to contribute in some measure to leveling the playing field for all manufacturers, offering the same digitalization, industrial IoT systems, and real-time ops analytics to all. Uh, so if anyone is interested in uh, digital transformation, or you just want to find out more about how IoT can improve uh, efficiency, reliability, or quality of manufacturing operations, uh, please feel free to uh, contact my colleague, Yuhan, or myself. Right, uh, I think that's all I have. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. We do have, uh, maybe we can take a couple of minutes to answer a few questions here, because there are some questions specifically for uh, Auk Industries itself. Joseph, maybe you can help uh, answer some of those. Okay, I can sure. help uh, read some of these questions to you. Maybe the first question is, uh, how do you see Auk Industries differentiative uh, from, uh, you know, large players like uh, Schneider, Siemens, and Rockwell? Okay, uh, good then, question. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, one of the key uh, differentiators for us uh, in terms of connectivity um, is that we are, we are brand agnostic. So we are able to uh, connect to a, a variety of different uh, uh, hardware. So it doesn't matter if your plant is made up of um, uh, Schneider, Electric, PLCs, uh, Siemens, PLCs, Rockwell, AVB. Um, we are able to connect to uh, uh, almost all of them. 
Uh, and secondly, I think we want to be differentiated from them in terms of the software uh, application. So what we built, uh, if you, you were following uh, my presentation just now, so instead of just the uh, machine level uh, metrics like OEE, um, uh, you know, defect rates, uh, we can actually look at the system level. So the, we have uh, provisional patterns uh, that we built uh, and uh, are looking to apply patterns. Um, in looking at the system representation of the whole plant, right? So this, this, this covers more than just the individual machines itself, uh, but we want to look across the machines because uh, in manufacturing operations, there's this concept called theory of constraints. Um, so it doesn't matter if um, your single machines are operating, uh, you know, at 100% OE, as long as they are not the bottleneck machine or bottleneck process, um, you are not really moving the needle in terms of the overall system throughput, right? So we want to be able to look at uh, the bottleneck processes uh, and make sure that what we spend in terms of resources, in terms of uh, uh, improving the system really goes into improving the overall plant uh, effectiveness instead of just that singular machine. So these, these are the, uh, the features that we built uh, are, I think, not not common to what you see out there if you look at uh, the offerings uh, from, from other players. So that's, that's where we, we uh, find ourselves a, a very important niche. And I think it's, it's very, very valuable in terms of improving the overall uh, uh, throughput as well as the uh, bottom line efficiencies of companies, right? I hope that answers the question. Sure. And Casey, I can point one question towards you as well. Uh, you know, the okay. question is on 5G technologies. Uh, basically, what are your actually to both of you? Uh, what are your thoughts on five G, and you know, what do you where do you see some of the use cases on five G? Okay, okay, uh, I will take this question. So, uh, of course, uh, now five G is a trend. Of course, uh, there is a twenty time faster in theory, twenty time faster than four G. So, in manufacturing, so uh, with the limited speed, you can do the monitoring, but you can do control because of the robot is uh, driving and you need to make the judgment, right? So you need to turn left or turn right or stop. So at the time you use the uh, slow technology like 3G, 4G, all those. So uh, they cannot wait for the decision, right? So with 5G, actually said, they can go up to the 20 gig per second, but based on our testing, I haven't reached to that uh, speed yet. So, but we still try to test all. The one, all those control layer, actually said with 5G, we can achieve uh, to control. Last time is a, we only can do the monitoring. So with that, actually, it's a 5G speed. We can do the control also. So it means that control is not on the edge. Actually, it's a control is on the server side. So server and uh, the device, okay, let's say EGV, then the, they can communicate very fast. So means uh, all those processing power, last time is uh, everything's on the, actually, it's the EGV itself. So that can actually lead to their battery drain and all those. Now everything move it to the server side and then they can do processing much more faster and then more effectively. So the one is that uh, now we try to uh, play that this uh, DSN times uh, synchronization award. So the one also uh, together with the 5G. So the one is that uh, we still testing in progress only. So with that, actually is that we can with 5G uh, speed, if we achieve in the whatever theory set, I think we can do more control on the factory level. I think, uh, I hope this answer your question. Yes, Casey, and I can highlight, uh, I think there is also a test bed at ARTC on 5G, uh, yeah. where they are testing some of the future technologies and applications. So those who are interested, please reach out to Casey or reach out to SGS Forum exactly. and we can help you to connect. You, you, you can come to the ERTC and then you can uh, make a factory visit, but uh, not, not, not this moment, maybe it's a one month later. So you can come to ERTC and can take a look whatever all those tests that we set up. Thank yep. you. Sorry folks, we are running out of time here, but there are some specific questions on off technology and IoT nodes, uh, basically. Uh, I think uh, what I would suggest is, uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, if we can take note of these questions and maybe we can ask uh, Joseph to answer them separately, if that's okay. Okay. And then we go from there. Yeah, maybe I'll just uh, end off with a short note, uh, just a very quick answer yes. on, on the questions. Um, so it really depends on uh, what you want to connect. Uh, we are really very flexible as a technology. So if you have like a temperature data or you have, uh, 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 you know, uh, some specific parameter that can actually be a proxy uh, for uh, wear and tear, 
uh, this can actually be uh, used uh, and also not just for one singular parameter we can fuse different parameters together to actually get uh, 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 a combined uh, information to, to actually find out when uh, the machine needs a repair or maintenance um, so I think I think for the more in depth uh, uh, answer, if you are, you need more clarification, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, by email or uh, my co my colleague, and I'll be happy to uh, uh, answer more questions more more in detail. Right, thanks for the question. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Joseph, uh, for your thanks, time Joseph. and sharing your interesting insights. And we hope uh, everyone a very good evening, and uh, hope this webinar was useful. If any questions, please feel free to reach out to. SCS Forum or to them directly and uh, look forward to the next uh, webinar series up coming soon. Look Thank forward to everybody. connect and have a good evening again, everyone. Bye for now. Yeah, bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye.